this is a very important topic as you can see that we have selected today nothing is more important than this part besides the patient care which we are all very of course is our main aim but seeing the scenario these days medico legal aspects of all the cases that we do not only in anesthesia but in our practice in other specialties also this has become so important so this webinar is of utmost importance for this we have very eminent speakers and the moderators today are very experienced they have a lot of practical knowledge and experience in these areas so i'd like to introduce our moderators dr ranju singh she is the director professor in the department of anesthesiology and critical care lady harding medical college she is um, she has keen interest in addition of course in obstetric and pediatric anesthesia and being uh, one of the senior most in her department she has a lot of experience in the medical medico legal area of their speciality our second moderator is dr amitab datta dr professor amitab datta is a senior consultant in the department of an in the institute of anesthesiology critical care and perioperative medicine at the sir gangaram hospital he is a professor of course but he has a special interest in ethics and legal aspects he has taken our hospital forward in the ethics and he is the member secretary and he the ethics committee of our hospital is very very strong under his able guidance no one could be better than these two moderators that we have today so now i'll ask them to start open the webinar by introducing the speakers and starting the lectures thank you very much yes ranju are uh, you are muted i think anju okay thank you very much ashwin and um, uh, yes a very very important webinar for all of us uh, in the clinical fields and it is with a great pleasure that i introduce the first speaker dr anjali who is a friend of many years dr anjali is a senior consultant in the institute of anesthesiology pain and perioperative medicine at sir gangaram hospital and her special interests besides obstetric and transplant anesthesia include ethics and legal issues in medicine i'm sure she has very very valuable information to give to all the listeners and i invite her to present her talk dr anjali please thank you dr anju As we all know law is an integral part of constantly evolving society and so is health so for next 20 minutes i'll be talking about law and health and interface so what is law different dictionaries give different definitions of law but law can be said to be a conduct of rule established by an authority which is able to enforce its will but is law static what happens when law is outdated no law is not static whenever society changes law also evolves it changes and a very good example of this is nalsa case 2014 in which supreme court recognized the third gender and also their fundamental rights what are sources of law in india constitution is the supreme source of law legislation or statutes are act are enacted by parliament ordinance is law promulgated by president in the absence of parliament session customs if they are long standing and reasonable they are also made law international treaties or conventions when they are signed by our country they are also made law like it act arbitration act or consumer protection act india follows common law system so judge made decisions or precedents are a very important source of law and precedent are normally binding on lower courts depending on the hierarchy of judiciary like supreme court decisions are binding on all the lower courts but high court decision of one state is not binding on high court decision high court of another state 
and in the absence of law on any issue supreme court judgments act as guidelines or law like vishakha guidelines which were given in 1997 after bhanwar devi case uh, were used by all the institute to protect women at workplaces till sexual harassment act was passed in 2013 now what is health world health organization defines health as a state of complete physical mental and social well being and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity it is a basic human right and it has been given to us as fundamental right by article 21 which says that no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except according to procedures established by law and over the years definition of article 21 has increased so much that right to sleep and right to privacy has also been included in article 21 or fundamental human right for good health not only good health care is required but all the determinants which affect health they also need to be improved in law it is said that ignorance of law is not an excuse and also ignorance of law excuses no one so health law is not just doctor patient relationship it also includes law related to public health and health care facilities and finances statutes are enacted these are the acts enacted by parliament to prevent violation of human right but it is very important for healthcare workers to know certain statutes which uh, which affect health like um, uh, mtp act suppose a patient of 19 years of age unmarried girl comes for mtp whether we need parents or guardians consent or not so the answer is in mtp act a non near relative non near related altruistic transplant is it legal the answer is in tota act advance directive by mentally ill patient is it legal the answer is in mental health act so it is very important for healthcare workers to know these statutes WHO says that it is government's responsibility government must generate conditions in which everyone can be as healthy as possible even our supreme court in says that right to health is government's responsibility in a landmark judgment by supreme court in pashchim banga khet mazdoor samiti case it was uh, told by the supreme court that right to health is basic fundamental right in this case what happened an agricultural worker fell off the train and was injured he was taken to six government hospitals where he could not be admitted because of lack of bed or lack of investigation facility so he was ultimately admitted to a private hospital and he recovered so he filed a case in supreme court and the supreme court told the government to pay compensation to the labor and also told government to make blueprint for healthcare services with particular reference during emergency another landmark judgment by supreme court was in permanent katara case 1989 permanent katara was a human rights activist and he came across an article in newspaper that a scooterist was hit by a speeding car and he was taken to a hospital where medical legal facilities was not were not available so he had to be taken to another hospital which was 20 kilometers away and he succumbed to his injuries on his way so permanent katara applied a pil in supreme court and interestingly in this case the petitioners and the opponent parties were on the same page that road accident victim should be attended to by a doctor in an emergency without waiting for medical legal formalities so so the supreme court gave judgment that it is according to article 21 it is the primary obligation of state to preserve life and doctor has a obligation to extend his or her services during emergency and it gave instructions to investigative authorities that doctor should not be harassed for interrogation and other formalities and when doctor is approached in emergency situation and feels that this patient requires better help for uh, saving his life it is doctor's responsibility to get proper expert help another interesting case was mr x versus hospital z in this case mr x went to hospital z 
and gave his blood sample for uh, blood testing before blood uh, before donating blood and he was found to be hiv positive and hospital z informed not only his friends and relatives but also his workplace and his fiance and he could not marry uh, his fiance and he had to leave his job so he filed a case against hospital z in the court saying that hospital z violated his right to privacy and also went against the medical code of ethics but supreme court in this case said the no, hospital z did not do anything wrong so in this case the public the right to health was given more priority over right to the affected person's confidentiality but society changed and a decade later hiv act came into force which gives lot of importance to uh, the affected individual's rights another legal principle is vicarious liability this is uh, one who gets things done through someone is as good as doing it oneself so whenever a doctor is held medically uh, negligent so the hospital or the government in cases of government hospital the state is held vicariously liable and in case of private hospital the hospital authorities are held vicariously liable for negligence now how law regulates doctor patient relationship mci that is medical council of india was statutory body till 25th september 2020 and after that national medical commission is the regulatory body for medical professionals and medical education but the mci code of ethics and regulations 2002 are still uh, uh, applicable in court of law and they are still valid when a patient feels that he or she has not been treated well by a, a hospital or a doctor he can seek remedy for medical negligence in three ways he can go to civil law criminal law or he can go to pro regulatory bodies that is nmc now it was earlier mci or uh, any councils under civil law patient can go to civil courts or consumer forums under civil court doctor can be sued either in under tort law or under breach of contract and in consumer forum there are courts at three levels state district and national and one can go to a higher level after 30 days of judgment from the lower court and a patient gets compensation only in civil law in criminal law if doctor is held medically negligent then uh, imprisonment can occur or doctor has will have to pay compensation and in pro regulatory bodies if doctor is held negligent the medical practitioner's license may be suspended what is consumer protection act in 1986 this act was enacted to check unfair trade practices but from 1986 to 1995 there was a lot of confusion whether medical professionals come under cpa or not but in historic decision in vp shanta case the supreme court said that services rendered by medical professionals come under cpa except the free services that is government hospitals and it is very simple for patients to go to cpa because it is technically easy no court fees required and no lawyer is required now in court of law how do we decide medical negligence has been done medical negligence is said to be done when a when a person fails to exercise reasonable care when he owes a duty of care towards the other patient so the court tries to take three steps to uh, come to a conclusion first of all duty of care whether doctor owes duty of care to the patient so duty of care also has three parts first when doctor decides to undertake the patient for treatment so duty of care starts here doctor has professional privilege doctor can refuse to undertake patient then the next step is deciding which treatment to give when there are more than one mode of treatment doctor has to decide which treatment to start there can be error at this level then it is actual administration of treatments there can be error at this level also so how does court decide whether there is error in giving treatment by applying the rule of reasonable man so the court tries to think 
if a reasonable man of same skill and with same carefulness does the same case would he have done the same mistake if the answer is no then this doctor is held uh, liable so then if the breach of duty if the court of law thinks that breach of duty has happened then the link between damage to the patient and the breach of duty is established if the if there is direct link then the doctor is held liable now what is bolum test this is a test for assessing the standard of reasonable care by skilled professionals it is a english tort law case if there are more than one uh, modalities of treatment and doctor has uh, taken one uh, mode of treatment and something wrong has happened to patient then the court tries uh, to gather evidence if there is any medical body of evidence if medical experts say that this modality of treatment is there is practiced by a responsible body then the court goes by medical uh, experts opinion then another test is bolitho's test so this was a uh, in 1996 bolitho versus city and hackney health authority this is a english tort case in this what happened was a, a small child of 4 years of age patrick bolitho was admitted to emergency department of uh, hospital hackney health authority and dr horn and dr roger were on duty and they were called they did not attend the patient immediately and when they did they did not intubate the patient who was in uh, severe breathlessness so a few hours later patient had uh, respiratory distress so that time they intubated the patient but patient died after a few hours so patrick's mother sued the doctor and the hospital authority here the court uh, the medical evidence was there that uh, intubation would not have helped this child even if he was intubated by dr horn initially he would not have uh, survived or the uh, but the court did not go by the uh, medical expert opinion the court here took decision itself that uh, if the child was intubated later on he could have been intubated earlier also so bolitho and bolum both are adopted here in indian courts and both are valid depending on the situation consent is very important medical practitioner is held liable if he starts treating a patient without proper consent and this concept of prior informed consent came after the samira kohli case when uh, when is a doctor held criminally liable so for criminal liability the principle of negligence is same that is the act of commission or omission is same whether uh, it is civil liability or criminal liability in dr suresh gupta versus government of nct of delhi 2004 the supreme court gave the concept of gross negligence the court said unless there is gross negligence or recklessness doctor should not be held guilty for criminal liability it was reiterated in dr jacob matthew case in 2005 the supreme court again said unless there is gross or grave negligence the doctor cannot be prosecuted under section 304a of ipc and doctor and the supreme court also gave guidelines that before initiating process of law against doctors due care and caution should be taken and for investigating office officers the court said that since they do not have sufficient medical knowledge so medical expert opinion should be taken before uh, some proceeding uh, is started against doctor and even if doctor is accused of rashness he or she may not be arrested in usual manner what is res ipsa loquitur this means the evidence speaks for itself it's a law of tort here if uh, the evidence is uh, there and it speaks for itself here the onus is on defendant to prove diligence otherwise in all other cases the burden of proof the onus is on complainant or the patient party to prove that negligence has been done by doctor or, or hospital but in cases of res ipsa loquitur the onus is on defendant doctor party to prove that due diligence was taken interestingly right to information act 2005 is also related to health care 
This act was enacted in 2005. And through this act, anybody, any person can apply for documents or personal records from any public institute. And reply has to be given within 30 days from date of request. So people can apply for uh, personal records from public hospitals and even private hospitals. Artificial intelligence is gaining its role in health and law, but uh, new technologies cause new challenges for uh, current liability regimes. To conclude, I would like to say new health issues are emerging and patients' rights are increasingly taking center stage. New and complex medical legal dilemmas are arising in clinical practice and in the relationship between patients and healthcare professionals. So it is very important to keep ourselves updated with medical laws. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ranjali. That was a wonderfully uh, delivered and extensively researched uh, talk. Um, I'm sure the participants have gained a huge amount of information from this talk. I think we can take the questions after we finish all the talks. Uh, That's right. Over to you, Dr. Amitabh, and I think we can finish the talks before we have a discussion on uh, this very relevant topic. Thank you, Dr. Ranju. Thank you, Dr. Sood. Thank you, Dr. Radha Krishna, sir. Uh, first of all, I want to thank ICA for giving me the privilege to part moderate this session on legal and ethical consideration in anesthesia practice. And it's my pleasure to call upon Dr. Savitar Malhotra to talk on informed consent in anesthesiology research. Dr. Savitar is senior consultant with Institute of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Medicine, Iksar Gangarama Hospital. Uh, he has been an avid clinical researcher for the last decade. And for last three, four years, he is, has lateralized his interest into medical ethics and he is continuously capacity building in this area. And recently he has been inducted as co-op member of Ethics Committee of Sir Gangaram Hospital. Dr. Savitar Malhotra, please, you can come forward and uh, present your, uh, what you want to say on this important topic. We are eagerly waiting to hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mehta for your kind uh, introduction and uh, respected seniors and uh, colleagues and friends. I'll be beginning my presentation on informed consent. So I'll be talking about uh, informed consent in uh, research mainly and uh, we all know that informed consent is a very important aspect in research. And uh, it ensures uh, that the study or research is ethical uh, in its uh, intentions and at the core. So these are the things I'll be talking about. Uh, autonomy, which is the main principle uh, of ethics uh, with which uh, informed consent is concerned. Then I'll be using research examples to uh, bring out different points like information and consent of in informed consent, then the informed consent document, which is used for research purposes, which has to be uh, sent to the ethics committee and which uh, should be properly documented. Then uh, I'll be talking about uh, how different persons are considered capable or incapable of giving consent. Then uh, uh, the population uh, which is considered vulnerable in research and how they should be treated and how the consent should be taken in these cases. Then uh, special participants uh, of research are children and adolescents which have uh, different considerations. I'll be talking about these points in my subsequent slides. So the informed consent, uh, it respects the freedom of choice of the participants, and it is very impo important for autonomy of the uh, participants. 
Now, autonomy in general, if we talk about autonomy, it is a very important part of ethics. And the important components of autonomy are intentionality. That is, uh, the person who is taking that action intends to do that action. And then there has to be an understanding of uh, the different uh, consequences of different actions that will be taking the options that the person has and what different options uh, the results that they can bring and then th uh, there has to be non-control or there should be no manipulation or coercion uh, to bring about that action that is participation in a research for, uh, that is for our purposes uh, this is the first example i'll be considering uh, this is a research which was done uh, with 22 subjects uh, live cancer cells were injected uh, in their bodies and this was done to check immunity against cancer uh, but the information which was provided to the participants was very limited and it was just uh, told to them that some cells will be injected the fact that cancer cells will be used in the research was totally uh, not mentioned in the information that was provided to them so the importance of information uh, the information has to be relevant. That is, any relevant information pertaining to the research should not be withheld from the participants. And uh, using deception or providing false information for recruitment is totally unethical. Uh, the language of the information should be simple and uh, it should be easily understood and it should be tailored according to the uh, needs and educational uh, level of the participants. Uh, the questions uh, should be answered. Uh, the participants may have different queries regarding the research methodology or uh, the benefits they might have uh, about the uh, from the research. Those questions have to be uh, properly uh, answered by the uh, one who is taking the consent. And they should be given adequate time to think, discuss, and decide their participation. And information should also be provided in a written format. If needed, other means of putting the idea forward, like audiovisual aids or charts, can be used to um, make the points clear. Then the consent part. The consent has to be voluntary and free without any uh, undue influence or coercion. The chief investigator or a researcher who has fair knowledge about the research and can answer the questions should take the consent. The consent should be signed or uh, thumb impression depending on the educational uh, status. And uh, it is uh, a proper proof and legal uh, document in research. Uh, then the informed consent document as such, it has two parts. Uh, one is the inf uh, the patient information sheet and the second is the informed consent form. Uh, the patient information sheet has some important facts about the research like its purpose and methods, the duration of the research expected, then the expected benefits or risks that are involved in the particular study or research, then uh, how the uh, process of data collection is done and how the researchers plan to keep the data confidential in uh, the coming years during the uh, research conducting of the research and even after the research is finished and how the data will be treated that all that information has to be provided to the participants then uh, whether any payment or compensation is uh, due to the participants uh, uh, while taking part in the research and it should also state clearly uh, that the patient is free, uh, the participant is free to take part or withdraw from the study at any point uh, during the uh, research. The details of the research team and the contact information should also be mentioned so that the uh, participant can uh, seek further clarification if, if required. And also if uh, he or she feels uh, that uh, he needs to complain uh, regarding the conduct of the research, he can do that uh, by contacting the uh, various participants, the researchers. Uh, then the informed consent form, 
has to be signed uh, properly by uh, for, uh, by the participant and uh, it should be archived uh, one copy of the patient information sheet is provided to the participant and the informed consent form is archived according to the ethic uh, committee protocols then i'll take the second example uh, in this 50 patients uh, between the ages of 13 to 39 who were either mental defectives or juvenile delinquents were given triacetyl oleandomycin which was a gram positive antibacterial agent uh, but this was given to treat acne and this drug was known to cause hepatic dysfunction especially in children but even then uh, it, this information was disregarded and they were given to treat a small condition a uh, simple condition like acne uh, after the research during the course of the research half of the patients ended up with significant liver dysfunction and eight of these had marked liver damage Uh, that case was to bring uh, the concept of capability and incapability of providing consent. So who is considered capable of giving a valid consent? Uh, those adults who have the ability to understand, appreciate the situation and its consequences and consider the various options and who are able to communicate their choices, they are considered capable. But as a rule, all persons should be considered capable of giving consent unless proven otherwise. So uh, as in the previous examples, the individuals uh, were uh, not capable of giving uh, the consent. So this can be due to various reasons like dementia, psychiatric conditions, or uh, conditions coming uh, because of trauma. So such persons need protection of their interest and the consent needs to be uh, taken uh, very carefully from a family member or a legal representative, uh, representative who has been appointed. The assent or agreement uh, or participation should also be sought and it should be recorded. Uh, but the assent uh, will depend upon uh, the condition of the participant, whether he can understand to some extent the uh, details about the research and its consequences or not. And then in third example, in this particular case, melanoma was transplanted from a daughter to her mother. The mother consented to this particular procedure. The experiment was done to see whether tumor antibodies produced by the mother could help the daughter's treatment. The daughter died one day after the transplant. After 24 days, a wide excision of the transplant was done, but the mother died of metastatic melanoma after about one year and three months. The fact that the daughter was terminally ill was not even disclosed to the mother. So it brings a very important point uh, of vulnerability. In that example, mother was vulnerable because of her emotional attachment and the condition of her daughter. So she consented to whatever procedure might uh, help her daughter. Uh, there are other reasons also for which a person may have an impaired decision capacity. Uh, the person may be mentally sound, but he may be incapacitated because of the social or educational or uh, political reasons. Uh, or some other circumstances. Uh, for example, people in hierarchical relations like uh, medical students or in the army or nursing students or other, uh, say, uh, care institutions, they may be vulnerable because of their uh, hierarchical uh, relations with the researchers. They might feel uh, pushed towards taking part or uh, uh, they may not uh, get the uh, facilities from that particular center. And so such people have more chances of being harmed or being deceived. So they need protection for their welfare. And it is very important for the researchers to plan uh, uh, different modes of protection. And the ethics committee also needs to take special care in these cases. And then the fourth example. Now, this study was done to look for urethral reflux in normal bladder 
for the study, 26 normal neonates who were uh, aged less than 48 hours, they were selected. And a cystourethrography was done by taking multiple X-ray films during filling and voiding of the bladder. At the end of the research, the finding was that there was no reflux found in the normal bladder. So this study highlights the types of dangers children can face during research. So my next uh, point is considering the uh, children and adolescents in research. So uh, as, as we have seen, the autonomy is definitely compromised when it comes to children and they have increased chances of harm. And so they definitely need more measures to protect their interests. The consent uh, has to be taken from the parent or guardian or a legal representative in the absence of parents or guardians. Uh, one parent uh, consent is sufficient if uh, the risk involved is minimal or there is direct benefit which can come out of the research for that particular child. Both parents have to be involved in consent if the risk is more than minimal and or if there is no benefit coming out uh, from the research for the child. The information sheet in, in these cases need also to include uh, the aspects which uh, of the research which can affect the growth and development of the child if uh, such things are there in the research or uh, if the child might be affected in psychological or uh, mental ways. Then uh, the assent I'll be discussing just later. Assent is usually taken for ages 7 to 18 years. And uh, the researcher has to ensure that the research should be carried out in a child-friendly environment uh, where the child feels uh, mentally and psychologically comfortable and he should receive uh, support, psychological support whenever uh, it is required during the research process. And the presence of uh, one of the parents should also be uh, there. Uh, the assent or agreement, uh, you can say, it is not proper consent because children less than 18 years cannot give a legal uh, consent. Uh, less than seven years, uh, no documentation is there. And actually, the assent is not always possible. Uh, between the ages of seven to 12 years, oral assent should be taken and it should be properly recorded. And it should be done in the presence of the parent or a legal representative. And between the ages of 12 to 18 years, a written assent should be taken. And uh, it may or may not be signed, but it should be definitely recorded and uh, it should be in the written format. Now, there are certain criteria for including children in a research. Uh, I'll be just mentioning a few of them which are uh, important. First is uh, when the disease or condition to be studied occurs only in children, that is it is exclusive to the children. So the study needs to be done uh, on uh, children of a particular age, depending on the disease or condition that is being studied. Then uh, in, um, mostly the children have different physiology and uh, drug pharmacokinetics and drug actions also vary in, in children because of their uh, physiology. So a study needs to be done in these cases uh, separately in children. Then uh, studied, uh, the children can be studied in those cases where a particular uh, research has already been done in adults and it was found to be safe and effective. And uh, it is also important that risk involved is minimum or when there is no way of generating the knowledge needed the scientific knowledge needed in a particular disease or condition uh, except uh, using the children for research in that particular condition. Uh, so I'll just conclude by saying that uh, informed consent is really one of the most important aspects of the research. Uh, it should be meticulously planned. Uh, the content of the information sheet has to be very thorough and all the aspects of the research methodology have to be uh, brought forward to the patient and the relevant information which they require to understand and to uh, make decision in taking part uh, of the research, they should be very clearly offered uh, in, as part of the informed consent. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Dr. Savitar, for presenting a complex aspect of medical practice that is informed consent and uh, so comprehensively and so lucidly. I'm sure uh, it will help the audience look deeper into or dwell deeper into the uh, matter. We can discuss it uh, after the third presentation. Thank you, sir. Welcome, Dr. Gautam. Uh, good evening, ma'am. I think the host has to, uh, this, the screen yes, sharing yes. is disabled at the moment. Oh. Now, will Sumit just look into it, Sumit? Yes, ma'am, I'll just look into it. And can we have his uh, CV slide also uh, displayed, please? And that's part of the... Uh... Yeah, that, that's all right. I just, um, while we are just um, waiting for um, Gotham's uh, slide to be displayed, I just wanted to place on record uh, that consent has become such an important issue for all of us. I know we'll have a detailed discussion later, but I can't help just saying that since I work in a pediatric setup, uh, the assent of children is now mandated. You know, we cannot pass any thesis now unless the students and the guide uh, take assent from the child. A written assent between seven to 12 years of age is mandatory. No thesis is passed now without this kind of assent. It's given, actually Kalavati Saran is a place where multiple WHO trials, international trials do take place and everybody wants these huge data set of uh, uh, children to be included in their studies. So we are very, very strict about these consent and our uh, ethical committee does not allow any study uh, to take place unless you agree to a assent of these children. And many a times it has been proposed, hopefully it will come into being from next year, that a video consent is now mandated before you can enroll any child into any study. So- um, uh, Ma'am, can I just interrupt you? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, can Ashwin, the ICA host, uh, give the privilege to Dr. Gautam to share his screen because he's joined as a guest, not as a host right now. Okay. Ashwin, can you listen to us? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you just uh, give the screen sharing for Dr. Gautam Girotra, please? Yeah, yeah, okay, he has done, done it. That. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ashwin. Is my screen visible? Yes, Gautam. Yes, sir, you're visible, sir. Please go ahead. Just a minute. Uh, Okay, Dr. Gautam is a senior consultant in anesthesiology and pain medicine at the Max Super Speciality Hospital. And apart from his clinical excellence has now started uh, lateralizing and gaining experience and expertise in uh, quality management and uh, healthcare organization related issues. He's an impaneled assessor for NABH. And I'm sure he has very, very valuable uh, information to give to all the participants. Now, welcome, Dr. Gautam, and we are eagerly waiting to hear from you. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, foremost, I would like to thank ICA for giving me the opportunity to speak on this topic. And uh, thank you, uh, Sood, ma'am, and uh, Dr. Radha Krishnan, sir. So, assault on healthcare workers uh, is it a new phenomena? Is it a global phenomena? Is it there in other jobs and workplaces? So these were the things which came into my mind when this topic was allotted to me. And subsequently, what's its impact? What is the root cause analysis? As well as what are the measures which we can adopt to obstruct the uh, assault on healthcare workers? No physician, however conscious or careful, can tell what day or hour he may not be the subject of some undeserved attack, malicious accusation, blackmail, or suit for damages. This statement is 130 years back. It was written. Uh, the person's name is not mentioned. The uh, journal is JAMA. So each and every word of this 
line is still still relevant today so let me frankly tell you that there are issues with the data there is no accurate quantification of violence is you know it's difficult the non verbal and less aggressive threats are difficult to measure there is a reluctance to report there is a workplace culture at every hospital at every organization and yes the mindset that some people consider it as part of the job and they therefore don't uh, you know report it so this is from china i know china is in new but this is from our own country this is during the pandemic we all saw these visuals and this is in one of the uh, corporate hospitals apollo delhi that was also during the peak pandemic so patient safety everybody talks but the worker safety nobody talks actually even if you see the you know from the government of india the patient safety implementation framework or uh, there are so many guidance documents for that but nowhere the worker safety is considered and is given a priority but yes in 2000 and 3 2 years back who actually uh, you know on a patient safety day which is celebrated in the month of september they actually said that yes speak up for the health worker safety so and you must have seen in recent times also in supreme court and other uh, you know judgments there is a certain element of you know uh, benefit of doubt i should say which is given which is being given to doctors probably because of the pandemic or winds of change i don't know let's come on to the main topic yes the definition of workplace violence incidents where staff are abused threatened or assaulted in circumstances related to their work including commuting to and from work and involving an explicit or implicit challenge to their safety well being or health uh, yes it is there in all other workplaces also but you can easily see that yes healthcare and social assistance it is 9.1% uh, you know per 1000 10000 workers the risk rate of intentional injuries whereas in average in other is around 1.9 yes the non fatal in intentional injuries by other persons by selected industries if we see that yes all industries it's an average of 2.1 but in hospitals again it is 12.8 with the psychiatric and substance abuse definitely it increases uh, you can easily demarcate the difference between health industry and other industries the fidra speaks itself for itself yes intimidation or the offensive or threatening language physical assault homicide or the sexual harassment of work, women at the workplace is also part of this assault on healthcare workers it's a global phenomena neither any religion nor any region nor any continent or country it is you know uh, specific uk it's one third of the healthcare workers have faced violence at workplace and similarly in usa on 2010 survey which suggested that more than half of the emergency room personnel were victims of physical violence including being spit on shoved or kicked uh, this is a very you know uh, very large database it's 331544 participants across 253 eligible studies 61.9% 61.9% of the participants reported exposure to any form of workplace violence 42.5% reported exposure to non physical violence and 24.4% experience physical violence, violence in last one year right so this is uh, in 2018 and yes uh, harvard business review suggested that uh, in the past uh, one year during the pandemic you know the cleveland clinic saw the frequency of threatening and violence behavior increase and the complaint rate jumped from 1.19 to 2.63 complaints per 10000 patients i know it's uh, us data but uh, unfortunately uh, so much data is in our indian setup is missing although there are few studies are there which i will delve upon on a little later 
Uh, yes, the Indian scenario, almost 75% of the doctors had felt that with one or the other form of violence they have experienced during their practice, nearly 50% of the violence were reported in ICUs. But yes, this is an you know, uh, often quoted report from newspaper, but uh, the study is not there in the public domain and information about its key findings can only be accessed through news reports about the study. With 56% of the doctors do not get a comfortable seven hour sleep most days of the week and 82.7% of the doctors in India feel stressed out in their profession. Uh, this is an Indian study in a tertiary care hospital in Delhi, 40.8% uh, percent uh, of the doctors reported, you know, they have been exposed to violence at their workplace in the past 12 months. There is no gender wise difference in the exposure to violence and verbal abuse was the most common form of violence reported. Well, yes, there is a difference between what the US and our, you know, India and other developing countries. There, the perpetrators are basically the patient themselves because they are under the influence of any alcohol or drugs or any, you know, they are suffering from any mental illness. But here, as we all know, the relatives or some unknown sympathetic individual or the habitual criminals and maybe even the political leaders are the brain behind the whole thing. Financial anxiety is not a casual factor in US and Europe because, you know, it's all, it is borne by the government. But yes, in India, uh, that is the financial aspects are the most important cause of assault on healthcare workers because the insurance penetration is low and unanticipated healthcare expenses often put you know families into trap of debt and financial instability. Then let's look at the genesis. Poor quality healthcare in the majority of the government sector. It's a poor infrastructure. Let us all admit and. Who are we to admit the Union Health Minister, uh, Minister Mansur Mandavia, also gave it in a written reply to a question in Lok Sabha that yes, the oldest functional aims in the country faces a demand supply mismatch in terms of far more patients requiring hospitalization with respect to the number of beds available. So that's the state of the uh, state of art hospital of the country. Uh, yes, media is also responsible. So this is what the media shows. And yes, the actual truth, we all know, the media has a role to play. And yes, we have a famous star, Hamid Khan. So Satyamev Jayate, I think a few people... And yes, uh, just for a minute, just see this. This is from a 2015 movie. So, I think media has a big role in this too. Uh, well, next, the poor socioeconomic status of the patient and the ever rising cost of the treatment and unrealistic expectation that paying more money should always save one's life. So, you know, there is an out of pocket expenditure, which I think you all know that these are the expenses that patient or the family pays, you know, directly to the healthcare uh, system, uh, which is apart from, you know, the whatever the government is actually spending, they, they are spending it by their own pocket. So uh, I think a couple of days back also in the media, there was some report that yes, the out of pocket expenditure has decreased in India. But if you see, it, you know, uh, in the world, we are nowhere. Uh, it's hardly, you know, uh, we are spending around the ideal is 15, less than 15. So we are in this area, you know, more than 49.35. In fact, in India, it is touching around 62 and 63. So uh, the out of pet expenditure is one of the important causes of, you know, the financial instability and therefore 
the assault on healthcare workers. And yes, the healthcare has always been a low priority with a GDP, you know, contribution is hardly 1.2 to 1.3 percent by the government. Whereas in uh, advanced and in developed countries like Japan and, you know, USA, it's touching more than 10. Misunderstandings, communications, yes, related to the etiology, disease explanation, dissatisfaction with the course of treatment, malpractices, yes, a part of it, perceived lack of communication or collaboration or inability to share information between doctor and patient. These are all the causal factors which actually lead on to misunderstandings and miscommunication and lead on to this phenomena. Yes, when a patient, you know, comes to a government hospital with a prolonged waiting time, there's a delay in attention or admission of sick patient. I think the, uh, in today's newspaper also it was there, but yes, the cause was different. But, uh, you know, these are very common things which we see uh, in many of the government hospitals. There's a perceived lack of availability of a senior doctor, I should say, or caring by the staff and dysfunctional equipment, poor quantity and quality of paramedical and supportive staff. Uh, it's there in across all the hospitals. It's nothing like uh, in a private hospital or a government hospital, but these kind of instances are always there, which actually contribute to the uh, assault on healthcare workers. So mob mentality and instant justice, as you all know, this is very much rampant in our society. There are so many instances of various kinds. I don't want to delve you know, on those things, but yes, a mob is a dangerous thing. It has numerous tons, arms and legs, but only one incoherent brain. Large security or inadequate security arrangements in uh, hospitals can also you know, uh, lead on to assault when there is no check. And overwork, yes, the doctors in hospital, the government hospitals are, you know, overwork. The directive is, I think, uh, Ma'am Ranju is also there. She's uh, from a government setup. And the directive is, you know, 12 hours for a maximum length of work with 48 hours per week. But yes, all the healthcare workers are working 36 hours, 108 hours in a week, and hardly any weekly holidays. So, uh, in our statement by the uh, you know uh, minister of state they said that yes the doctors at central government hospitals work for maximum 40 hours in a week and uh, unfortunately we all know that this is not the fact and yes the doctors have countered this government statement too uh, doctor's misbehavior, yes, uh, I hope you all know about the obstructed violence. Many of the government hospitals, in fact, uh, 20 years back when I was doing my internship, I also saw the same thing, that nobody takes a consent from a pregnant woman, whether they want to do a, you know, the gynecologist wants to do a per vaginal examination before the delivery or not. So these are all the things which actually lead on to an obstructed violence and ultimately to assault on doctors. Nobody takes a consent on. So no, it actually, you know, the psychology of the patients of the society it alters the entire thing. So this misconduct can definitely lead on to violence against doctors. And in uh, countries like Argentina, Venezuela, and Italy, also it is regarded as a punishable offense. Societal so factors, road rage, we all know, we all read it in newspapers. So more aggression in the society. Uh, so the demands are more, the expectations are sky high, and the same is reflective in the in our hospitals too. The attendants have unrealistic high expectations of patient recovery without understanding the gravity of the situation. And in case of death of the patient, the attendants take immediate revenge by acts of violence rather than taking legal action, which could arise from a lack of trust in the Indian judicial system. And, you know, it's okay to hit someone. This is uh, or the police is hitting. So this is how the psychology of the society is. Demand and supply gap, I've already delved into it, that yes, there's a huge, huge gap, and this, which translates into a deficit of six lakh doctors in India alone. Political interference, grievance redressal system being poor and slow, and low health literacy in population with myths and false beliefs leading to failure to understand a rational view. All these leads uh, to uh, scenarios like this. And this is a study of workplace violence experienced by doctors and uh, in a tertiary hospital, uh, 
Sardajan Hospital. So the young doctors are more prone. The female doctors in this study faced more violence and more reported in obstetric and gynecology department, followed by medicine and surgery. So I know I'm running late just so when clinicians fail to meet the expectations of the patient they are doing their best to help there's a potential for demand threats and this is what the media you know so this is how the media shows and this goes on into the psychology of the nation of the society so yes, the impact of patient care, there's a tendency to withdraw from patient care. We all have seen this, the doctors are avoiding risky operations due to prostitution threat. This was a survey finding, which was published in the newspaper. And then uh, a survey of the impact of disruptive behaviors and communication defects on patient safety. So ultimately, you know, the patient safety is uh, takes a hit. Violence leads to strike. And uh, this is the record of the strikes which has happened. Uh, it's an old report, 2018. So uh, many of the dormant setups, it has shown that yes, they frequently go on to strikes because of these reasons. So as a measure to, you know, how to control it, that's most important. So it's a quadruple helix model, which uh, I read it somewhere else, but I have applied this model here because there is a, significant role of the government, media and society, patients, hospitals and doctors. And you cannot say that it's 25% of the government or 25% of the patients or 50% of them. No, it is all intermingled and everybody has an uh, equal, I should say, it's an effective role it has to be there of all these four stakeholders. Uh, role of the government, yes, the GDP, until unless the GDP rises, nothing, you know, it on ground, nothing is going to happen. The health infrastructure is not going to improve. The government needs to fill the vacant positions, define the duty hours, condemn such acts rather than perpetrate them. Damages should be recovered from patients, persons, and assault on any doctor should be assault on government officer on duty. And yes, training, green corridors, proper ambulances. So these are all things until as the GDP increases the, you know, uh, proportion of uh, health uh, to the GDP, it's not going to change. Uh, well, yes, COVID uh, with the Indian Epidemic Act, which was changed, the ordinance and uh, the incidents of violence and harassment would engage in COVID-19 was a punishable offense. And this is what a few of the hospitals in Rajasthan, they actually displayed on their hospital that, yes, if there is any untoward incident like this, then they will have to pay the penalty. Uh, the role of media, yes, write positive things about the profession, or at least both sides of the views. That's more important, both sides of the views and situations, rather than just giving the uh, narrative of the public. This is from media trials of the doctors, which should be left to the courts. Uh, I know many of us have seen this movie, Anand. It's a beautiful movie which lays the foundation of a patient and a doctor. Uh, I know they have added a lot of masala into it. But yes, uh, if we see the crux of the matter, there it is a very, very uh, important movie with respect to the patient and doctor relationship. And there still would be scores of Anand still practicing the same way as Anand did in Anand. And it is because of these Anands that the faith in the system, though shaken, has still not been obliterated. Uh, these kind of, you know, we all remember this uh, journalist barging into an ICU and, you know, uh, put in, un, you know, intimidating the doctors during the pandemic. So these all things have to be avoided. The society has, they should embrace the doctors because we are all part of them. Uh, we have always seen, you know, candlelights and all those things whenever there's an outrage uh, against women, children or the common man. But yes, None of us, our friends and family, in fact, you know, they never uh, hold play cards and seek action against the violence which is there on the medical fraternity. I have never seen it. In fact, the Zomato person also, you know, there was a, so much on social media, but yes, uh, for doctors, the support is very less. Uh, 
patients yes they should be you know reading about the correct diseases correct sites they should be referring to before uh, having a discussion with doctors and uh, they must understand that yes we cannot perform miracles and we can just modify the disease process but we cannot prevent mortality it is still immortality is still out of bounds for the medical profession institutions yes cctv cameras sound security restricted entry of relatives display the number of beds vacant you know all these things we have learned from covid also the display is there a regular communication with the patient and the attendants have to be there so i think delhi government and many other hospitals have a security a foolproof security system these days and yes a nudge theory is there that positive reinforcement and indirect suggestions should be you know there which to achieve a non forced compliance so at indiana university you know it's mentioned there please take the responsibility for the energy you bring into this space your behavior matters and this is a picture of my uh, workplace so it's mentioned you are in a healing space this is no under zone let's focus on peace patience and compassion so these things of nudges you know can actually go a long way <clears throat> uh code violet or purple there is a standard operating procedure for that many of the nbbh hospitals uh, do have this protocol and it is practiced regularly where uh, if untoward incident like this happens or is about to happen an alarm is put on and uh, people come there for uh, help and they form a human chain family communication as i said is very important this is from my own hospital so you know long duration surgeries at regular intervals the patient uh, family are informed about yes the surgery is about to start and uh, whatever is the status of the surgery at that time so role of doctors yes ethical medical practice uh, there is no doubt beyond, uh, for this and a participatory approach has to be there and evidence of violence in the form of photography video recording should be witnessed and be collected and the consent also you know has to be taken in a, a better way it has already been dealt by my previous speaker uh, second opinion should be given very carefully with the careful choice of word because we all know uh, somebody you know equally qualified or uh, has already given one or the other opinion uh, training and communication skills are very very important and uh, medical council of india now the nmc at com module is their attitude ethics and communication so it has to start from the beginning from your mbbs only so it's a very very good initiative which has been taken by the nmc so uh, it will actually go a long way in avoiding these kind of issues and uh, have a good patient doctor relationship nabh also is a special chapter you know uh, objective elements on effective communication and training so all the nabh hospitals generally uh, you know look into this matter Uh, very seriously, and there are guidelines on workplace violence also. And this is a recent edition, the fifth edition of NABH, which says that the organization should have measures in place for prevention and handling the workplace violence. Training, uh, yes, the staff should be trained with refresher course about ALS, PLS, all these things actually, actually, actually improve upon the. uh patient dealing and uh, consent has already been dealt with indemnity insurance is an important thing which has to be there for all of us and ic and isa have already taken initiative for the same and role of senior doctors must they should step in when the situation demands and because you know once the patient party patient and the family talks to a senior doctor many things are diffused at the same time uh stamp is you know when a doctor should be alert so if there is any stirring if there is a change in the tone and voice anxiety approaching mumbling patient so these are things which it has been you know published in 2007 as a component of observable behavior that indicates potential for patient violence in emergency departments so it's an important uh, you know reference which i got um so i think we all have heard about the elephant and the six blind men so some said it's a, one said it's a fan it's a wall it's a rope so but uh, you know for healthcare in this scenario uh, everything is important ears listen to the patients and learn from your seniors 
knows see can grab the new technology enabled opportunity so whether it is uh, you know artificial intelligence online appointments radiology reporting we all see the reports are given fast you need value proposition there has to, the doctors and the healthcare workers have to be protected at all times a second opinion increased workforce has to be there four strong pillars strategy structure system support infrastructure so whether the strength which is required to cannot be uh, you know anything related includes the communication skills training and code violate infrastructure changes cctv camera i've already dealt with that so create an innovative uh, ecosystem which is you know which states appropriate care of the patients and strong system to overcome the challenges of workplace violence and reporting with uh, root cause analysis and corrective action preventive action and guide other and collaborate to achieve the overall objective collaboration and partner in terms of components of overall healthcare ecosystem uh, the government society media and healthcare workers all together uh, lastly uh, there's an article uh, which actually dealt with the workplace violence against anesthesiologists i think this is the only article which i found uh, we are also not immune to this patient safety threat so uh, what this article said that uh, yes there is a workplace violence and physician in a different specialties actually many a times the majority of the times uh, the uh, perpetrator i should say and we all know who the physician in a different specialty as far as the anesthetist are concerned can be uh, so uh, just a minute Uh, from my hospital only during the covid pandemic you brought me fame and fortune and everything does grows with it i thank you all but it's been no bed of roses no pleasure i consider it as a challenge before the whole human race and i am not gonna lose we all are the champions my friend and we'll keep on fighting till the end this is adapted from queen we are the champions and uh, thank you very much thank you very much dr gautam very very comprehensive and very well presented uh, the session is now open for question and answers and discussion from all the participants uh, at present i can't see any uh, questions in the chat box so we'll wait for any questions as and when they come so the, the it's open for discussion from all the people who are participating healthcare violence is something which most of us have been exposed to and gotham 75% in india is a very very alarming figure much higher than one third yes. of one fourth in us and usa and i think at one point of time uh, we've all faced this in one form or the other at least verbal abuse many of us have faced while working in the emergency department uh, one thing i like to add is yes you really mentioned you know lack of infrastructure absence of a significant gdp towards healthcare and you know that's very important reason why uh, violence is occurring but lack of protection or lack of retribution is another very important reason you know uh, when doctors get beaten up uh, the public gets away with it you know there is no punishment for them the moment this message gets around to the public that if you beat up a doctor you will get punished for it things will begin to take uh, a different hue i think that's very very important that uh, the law may be on our side now because of different acts but the protection is not there in the form that you know uh, there's no um, there's no attribution for this kind of crime i that's that really uh, hurts and another thing as a now uh, it's been so many years I, you know you have regret and you have uh, feelings of sadness and frustration and you are upset but you know at the end of it if you have regret because of violence of having taken up this profession 
that's a very, very sad thing to happen. And that's happening in a couple of people, you know. You regret that we doctor bane, you know. It's very, very sad. And for senior people like us, my children refuse to become doctors, Gautam. You know how much, what an, it's such a cascading effect. Uh, intelligent, smart children are not being uh, taken up into medicine just because of this one reason that there is so much violence against doctors. It's a very, very sad state of affairs. My children just refused. They said, we will become a doctor doctor. So I'm sure the other also and along way. with that, ma'am, that job burnout, the post-traumatic stress syndromes, you know, all these things. That's all right. But yes. regret, you know, regret yes, of having definitely. taken up this profession. How can yes. you counteract this kind of uh, feeling? It's really, really sad. You did correction also, uh, Gautam. On the brighter side, you said residents don't work. Believe me now, residents don't work more than 48 hours a week. Uh, things have changed from the time I did my internship 30 years Yes, you were right. We were working 100 hours plus, but residents have thankfully become much smarter. Even if we try to push them, they don't work more than 48 hours a week. That is on record. In fact, the residents are on strike. for the Maybe season. the uh, reference which I quoted is 2016. So maybe yes. the things, so things have, have yes. looked up in that direction. In fact, the right, residents right. currently today uh, for the past three days have been on strike across the country. Yes. In, at least they are there in all government hospitals. They are completely on, on emergency services. This is because they think they're working more because the junior PGs haven't come in. So they're not working more than 40. We are, as I'm a roster in charge for the residents and I cannot put them on duty for more than 48 hours. So it's a good thing. It's a good thing that you can push them beyond a certain point. So <laughs> I see Dr. Arun Mehra's hand wants to comment, make some comment, expert oh, comment. Madam, Arun Mehra. Actually, yes, thank you, madam. I've just put it in the chat box also. Uh, there was yes. there were excellent presentations. To what uh, Dr. Gautam said, I'll add two practical things. One is that a few years ago, the Indian Express uh, sent one of their journalists to spend 24 hours with a, an intern in Safdarjung Hospital. And then he got to know the realities and he wrote I mean, excellently about it, he explained the difficulties. Uh, so, you know, like uh, journalists are at times embedded with armed forces and all that, it should be with, we should encourage this. In fact, we had this uh, as a panel discussion in one of our ISA cons recently in Delhi four, five, six years ago. The second point I wanted to raise was that uh, I've been doing a lot of research on mob control. I made a presentation on that. And, you know, I looked up uh, police, uh, manuals and things and mob control is something that doctors have to be taught just the same way they are taught uh, about uh, taking consent and all that because it's usually one person who is leading the mob and I mean it was a very complex thing I can't go into it here but they said the psychology is if you can just get that person away whether by bribing him with something or anything, the rest of the mob falls silent. There were many other aspects. This is the one I found more, most important. So this is what I wish to add. Thank you, madam. SA node ko control karna hai. Hello. No doubt, no doubt, no doubt. <laughs> AV node apne aap control ho jayega. Ji, 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 ji. Sounds Hello. Sound Hello. Could I be yes, here? Hello. Yes, sir, please, we can, we can hear you, sir. Yeah, uh, my question is to Savidar. Is there any need of return concern these days? Return concern. Sometime back, say, I may say, sometime early this year, a notice has come from the courts of Maharashtra that concern should be in return form. We can have the printed document, but apart from the printed document, the patient or the patient's immediate relation, if patient is not able to do it, has to write in person. Is it still valid or not? Uh, sir, uh, good evening. Uh, it is good important. Evening, 
yes sir sir it is important that uh, whatever the consent is it is tailored to the particular uh, surgery or procedure that has to be taken uh, a pre formatted consent uh, usually is not considered right so either it can be written uh, handwritten or uh, even if it is uh, typed but it has to be tailored uh, as according to the particular surgery then uh, that can be signed from the patient and uh, the uh, family members that means it should be correct. specific it's correct all the court wants that way that there should be some part of the consent as written am i correct Uh, it needs to be spe specific uh, as it per can be the printed. patient condition. Should it be written, ma'am? Uh, it has to be written. It has yeah. to be written. Some as some part has to be written. Your format is always there. Where you write the specific complications, the potential yes. complications, or the risk factors which a patient has, that has to be definitely written. But otherwise, it's generally you know most of the hospitals and NABH, printed, yeah. Where, yeah, it's a printed form. But yes, there are columns there where we can easily write the patient specific risk factors yes. which ASA we are accepting and whatever are the you know potential post op complications or everything. so it ha it cannot be just that the patient party writes it on a piece of paper and which is not signed by the uh, doctor uh, so that is doesn't work it has to be signed by the patient a witness as well as the uh, surgeon the or the anesthetist yes, whoever yes, yes. simply a consent signed time. by the patient is not valid yes correct it is not simultaneously valid. signed Simple. by the doctor yes, yes. absolutely some and especially the time in It, yes. you know the time in it cannot be that the patient is signing at 2 pm and the doctor in the you know the senior doctor comes at 5 pm in the evening and signs it no it is not valid in the court of law the yes. time in also has to match that yes the doctor was physically present to explain the risk and complications to the patient at that particular time so these are you know the time in Yeah, time, time and I think a separate time. consent is required for the repeat procedure. If if even if for the same disease, definitely open or you know you need to take a separate consent if it's on a separate occasion and a separate day. Yes, that is just that for is, dialysis. That is sorry. that is there separate consent there. It's not that way. If you go into do a particular surgery, the consent has to be made available at least three or four hours earlier only, not earlier than that. Uh, you generally, cannot, you cannot get a consent on the previous day. No, even if it's documented consent, you can't because you have to have it done something within the six hours of surgery. It has to be done, sir. Usman, what yeah. the uh, both sons say, and you know, in the policy, it should be mentioned. uh in the hospital policy that yes when are you going to accept the consent whether it is 24 hours or 48 hours it depends but yes if the physical condition or the condition of the patient has changed then definitely it will change but uh, there cannot be a timeline that 6 hours or something it has to be mentioned whatever is the timeline it has to be mentioned in the policy and number 2 when we were discussing about the consent the, for the patients of dialysis so it is not possible for a detailed consent at every time you know the patient comes for a dialysis so those consents are generally valid for 6 months but yes the endorsing has to be done at each visit by the uh, patient so a signature simple signature on the same consent is taken another doubt you were telling about the consent in children of 70 to 12 years of age that means they cannot participate without their permission or without their consent without them being told about what they are going to be subjected and only with their true knowledge they can participate how far a kid and that to an average kid a 70 to 12 years kid understands all these things we are in so, india look about that how far a 70 to 12 years old kid knows about all these things that one is subjected to a particular research program and what may be their forthcoming immediate reactions what may be the long term effects all these things do you think all these things possible at least for some years with our present education standards in each area uh, you had sir, a concern uh, Uh, yeah, sir, please. it is. Uh, it is not uh, a consent. It is just an assent. That is, 
uh, depending upon the understanding and the age of the child, whatever he understands uh, in a plain and simple language, whatever we can make uh, him understand. No, the speaker was telling almost all the research which takes on in the Kalavadi Hospital in Delhi. Well, the permission is not given by the ethical committee to go ahead with the research since the 7 to 12 years old patients are not well informed about what is going it is to not consent now. sir it is not consent the consent is given by the parents or the guardian along uh, with that consent and assent from the child is also taken it is not okay i am only on, i am only on that part assent from the child that means permission from the child yes, i mean sir. yeah if you have to explain whatever the law says that you have to explain whatever you can in the simplest of language which the child will understand at least about what the procedure he is undergoing and if there are any serious consequences for him. The rest of the detailed consent can be taken from the parents. But parents could be consulted by law. So these are the ICMR guidelines. Yes. ICMR yes. has given guidelines that between 7 to 12, child must be told about the procedure before uh, taking him up for uh, so any research. Yes. And research verbal or consent even any is procedure. required. Procedure. Verbal verbal. procedure. And we are following that, sir. In majority, I think majority of the places where pediatric research is going on, this is being followed. And 12 to 18 years of age, written assent is required. Written assent. 7 to 12, it? verbal assent. 12 to 18, written assent. 12, yes. 12 to 18, I agree in India. 7 to 12, even if you speak to the child, will the child understand what it is? Yes, the, law says, yeah. yes. the law says, yes, the child will understand. You have to make him understand and take his assent. The law Don't you think we had to... Don't you think we have to make the lawmakers know about our children are not that much mature enough to know about all these things? Anyway, that's a but, particular matter besides the concern of this particular lecture. Yes. Next, uh, you are telling about the violence in the hospital. Violence is in each sector. Don't worry about the health sector alone. In every particular area, there is violence. But we have to live with the violence. Our children or the present day children or present day smart children don't want to go home doctoring. It's just because there are more opportunities known to them now. It's not like the day is some 40 years or 50 years back. At that time, the safe profession or the safe job one can get or any time job you can get was in doctoring or engineering. That's the reason all we are going. Now it is not like that because you may get Combatively a better job in all other areas. That's the reason why people are not that much interested. And again, the media says so many things happening in one particular area and people naturally have the tendency to fly away from that particular area. That's my feeling. Yeah. Okay. Um, Dr. Anjali, I have a comment about your HIV and consent. I'd just like to highlight that when we talked about HIV and consent, uh, there are certain exceptions to the rule. Uh, the uh, treating uh, will not break his disclosure yeah. of, uh, ethics. It discloses the HIV status, one, to the spouse, mm -hmm. most important, who's living with the patient. Mm -hmm. Because that spouse is at continuous risk of acquiring the disease and her or his life. So, you know, you don't violate the disclosure of this information to uh, one, the spouse and any other treating doctor who is going to come in contact with that patient. You can disclose the HIV uh, status of the patient to the treating doctor. For that, you don't need uh, the patient's consent. A lot of other things you do, but these are two very major, uh, impractically, two major exceptions of the rule for consent in the case of an HIV patient. Am I right? Yeah. HIV Act says that only spouse needs to be told about patient's HIV status. And uh, for any uh, admission anywhere or... Uh, any treating physician, you know, suppose you hand over the case to another doctor who's going to come in contact with him and, you know... For that, you can do. You can inform. You that. can inform. Yeah, you can yes, inform. Yes, 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 yes. 
And uh, for the sake of discussion and all the participants, uh, what about HI, about cyber law and uh, medical uh, professional with more and more healthcare going online? Uh, what what do you think about the cyber laws and you know what, what about consent when you're treating the, there were so many uh, guidelines during the COVID period that you can you know uh, treat them with on WhatsApp treat them online uh, review prescriptions give them medication so uh, what do you say about that we have telemedicine guidelines which are uh, stat which is an act it has been incorporated yes. in uh, yeah MCI code of medical ethics. Yes. as 3.8 so yes. all healthcare workers they must go through it and uh, they must know very, the very guidelines yes. Yes. So it's very important uh, everything is there in details how consent is taken and what is first visit what is follow up visit yes in telemedicine so uh, must practice it any other questions uh, for the uh, speakers from um, the, the participants. We ha don't have any question in the chat box except, uh, uh, of course, uh, a, a lot of congratulatory message presenters uh, who've done such a fantastic job. It's such an interesting uh, evening for all of us. So, uh, Jeshri, ma'am, uh, uh, do you want to say yes. anything? Yes, Ranju. Yes. Well, we've had a very um, uh, interesting and very uh, uh, interactive uh, webinar today with our expert moderators and the speakers. And of course, we didn't have many questions in the chat box, but I'm sure the listeners have <clears throat> really understood and grasped the what was the important uh, aspect of it. And with the, uh, so I'd like to thank our moderators, Ranju and Amitabh, and our speakers, Dr. Anjali, Savitar, and Gautam for their excellent uh, lectures. And also uh, Dr. Sumit, who has been helping us and is really, uh, I should say now, going in the footsteps of Sanish to be able to conduct our webinars. And thanks a lot, Ashwin. You're also participating and helping us out. That's thought to you as well. So another very important announcement that I'd like to uh, tell all our participants as well as our viewers is that next week will be our ICA CON, that is our National Conference of the Indian College of Anesthesiologists, which is on the 17th, 18th, and 19th, being hosted by the Molana Zad Medical College. You've been getting information uh, at, at very many forums, and please do, we've got a very good registration, but I'm sure some of you could still get a chance to register. Don't miss it. They are very interesting workshops, as well as the lectures are going to be very fruitful. So I invite you all and go on to the website of the IC and see the detailed program, 17th, 18th, 19th of December, next week. Thank you very much. Dr. Radhakrishnan, would you like to add something before we finish off? Nothing, nothing, ma'am. Please yeah. go ahead. It was a lot of excellent sessions. Yeah. yeah. So thank you very much. Okay. And uh, as a corollary to today's lecture, the next week's program is on the communication skills. Oh. What you require. Yeah. Great. Yes. That. In fact, one of important. the workshops, ma'am, Jeshri, ma'am, one of yes. the workshops in ICACON next week is communication skills. There's a whole day workshop dedicated uh, to yes skills which yeah. has become yes. a very important part of the curriculum absolutely, absolutely. Right. where we have to give very more true. trust yes yeah. yes yeah if we <laughs> yes thank you very much thank you so very much can, yes bid goodbye and see you all physically next week thanks, thanks a lot good, good. thank you thank you, you. Thank thank you, you Radha Krishna, sir thank, thank you, you. Thank thank you, you. Ma'am, and thank a you, very very good night to all the